Welcome everyone uh, to this webinar. It's organized by the STEAM Edge Scientix and the STEM Alliance project. My name is Eddie Grandmeyer. I am a project coordination and pedagogical officer for the European School Net, and it is my pleasure to be your host this evening. Today, we will learn from our speakers how they contextualize STEM careers in the classroom to promote integrated STEM teaching. So first, uh, I'd like you to know that this webinar is being recorded and the video will be available on the European School Net YouTube channel, as well on the STEAM Ed Scientix and STEM Alliance platform and the, on the live event of the MOOC uh, Integrated STEM Teaching as well. So before I introduce our speakers, I'd just like to go through a few housekeeping rules. Uh, my colleagues Eleni, Rocio and Maria are here to help you with any technical issues you may have during the event. So if you face any problem, please reach out to them on the chat and they'll be able to help. In the chat, you will also find a link to the signature list for this event. So we would like to ask for you to fill in take a second during the presentation and fill in this form. It is mandatory to fill it in if you wish to receive a certificate of attendance for the webinar. And if you have any questions for our presenters, uh, please post your questions on the chat uh, and we will address them uh, during or in between the presentation and at the end of the webinar. To streamline the event, we are not taking any questions in person, so please make sure to post them in writing. Now, let me introduce our first speaker for the evening. Claire Flamand works at, for the Ministry of Education of Luxembourg. She is an art and drama teacher, and she's passionate about interconnecting creativity, new technologies, innovation, and pedagogy. Today, she'll introduce a newly created school subject called Digital Sciences and its interdisciplinary STEAM approach. Claire, thank you for joining us, and the floor is yours. Hello, Eddie. Hello, everybody. Thank you first uh, so much for this, uh, in, uh, this invitation and the possibility to speak about our new school um, subject. So uh, before I'll get into the detail of the subject, digital sciences, I would like to, um, yeah, to show a little bit the Luxembourgish uh, context. I'm just waiting till the presentation is visible. So yeah, let's uh, first thank you, Eddie, again, and all the, the team be uh, behind STEMIT, Scientix and STEM Aliens. I'm really, really excited to do this uh, with you tonight. And yes, as I told, told now a little bit about political and educational context here in Luxembourg. First of all, the place I work for uh, is the script, and I think it's uh, really important to explain a little bit how this works. The script is the coordination service of pedagogical and technological research and innovation and has uh, yeah, about six div div different divisions. And uh, one of the divisions I work for is the innovation division. So it's very, very interesting and, uh, and adventurous to work there. And it is in this setting um, that the idea of uh, 21st century skills came up and uh, the necessity to, yes, to update a little bit uh, our education system that came the idea up for digital sciences. It's, uh, it began uh, three or four years ago when the Minister of Education, Claude Maes, uh, set a priority for Luxembourg education and it is the 21st century skills and uh, you know certainly the different uh, framework there uh, that are existing like the four C's or six C's and uh, Luxembourg has five C's so creativity, collaboration, critical thinking and uh, the fifth C is coding. Before we get uh, to the subject, we were working on the Luxembourgish Pedagogical Guide to Media Literacy for Schools, and we based this work on the DigCom of, uh, European, uh, of the European Commission. So you see the different 
different areas or competencies areas uh, for uh, of the DigiComp, and we adapted it and we launched just before the lockdown we launched the median compass you see here that was the 10th of march uh, 2020 and uh, if you want to have a closer look you can go visit the website edumedia.lu and you can find it in french and in german based on this work um, uh, we have in primary school uh, these five areas that are worked on are the teachers with the the pupils and uh, this year was the the kickoff of uh, integrating coding into the two last school years and um, as we are really aware that it is important to not to focus on this coding uh, that is uh, actually uh, the point three dot four of our competencies frame uh, and to extend it to all the other uh, competencies areas uh, the the working group is now uh, on um, on reflecting how all these different areas can be implemented in uh, in the subjects from the first year on so that's uh, the actual work of this group and uh, yes uh, to be consequent and logic uh, it uh, it was uh, evident that this work on competencies has to be followed up uh, in secondary school and um, as Claude Maisch announced it, our Minister of Education uh, announced it, digital sciences is um, yeah, actually the school's response to the digitalization of our lives and our working in environment. So it, it is actually really a priority, a political priority. And uh, yes, you see here the, the, the fresh and new logo of digital sciences and also the six areas and subjects uh, I'm going into um, in the second part. Now let's go for digital sciences. It's actually about building bridges. Um, you know certainly that we we have uh, in each country different uh, cat categories of uh, important subjects, and uh, the discussion is very old. Where should we integrate uh, STEM competencies or media literacy competencies? And um, everybody is quite, yeah. Uh, sure about the fact that it should be everywhere, but uh, in reality it's not as easy as that. As that. We had the opportunity to have a, a school su subject as, uh, as this, and we saw it immediately as a building opportunity, building bridges opportunity between the subjects. Here you have an, an overview uh, over the six areas we are we are working in this uh, subject, and um, yes, the first one is my digital world and me. Uh, the, it's really important to yes to begin with the student a student centered approach, and we are uh, working with them on how how uh, with with yes how do you actually use uh, digital uh, technology in your everyday life so that's the first area it's uh, not only but mainly about communication the second area is is going a little bit wider the world wide web it's web and me so when i'm on the web how how what is going on on it what uh, is the 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 front but also the back end of it here you see the hashtag critical thinking. The third area is more likely on the language of, um, of machines. Do you speak IT, my language and their language? There, um, there, there are lots of uh, knowledge, uh, technical know-how and also, uh, yes, know how to be on big data and uh, on the Internet of Things. The fourth is our, 
also very exciting. It's all about the game, uh, analog or digital, alone or together, a whole program, not only in the sense of entertaining program, but also on the sense of, yes, programmation language. So there, uh, the computational thinking process is very important uh, and collaboration too. The fifth area is the robots partner for better or worse and um, it's it's very funny in this area because uh, we are we are going to work with the the students uh, with their imagination about robots because we have uh, we have all of us i think the image of a robot very uh, uh, likely, um, how do you say, yes, like Pixar or Disney present them to us. And uh, here it is, yes, a possibility to compare what is your image of robot and what are robots in real life and why are they there? And uh, yes, in, in what case they are really, really helpful and what should we... Um, uh, know about also perhaps the dark sides of the robots. The last area is is about artificial intelligence. Is there such a thing as a machine that is smarter than me? It's also about creativity, and on this area we are, yeah, we are starting very basically with face recognition because um, if it is on Snapchat or Instagram or or, or yeah, or other places, uh, this, the, the students of today really use it uh, very often with uh, bunny ears or uh, some less, more or less uh, creative stuff. But they don't know that uh, only for that filter func function you need artificial intelligence and then we are inviting them to yes to 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 yeah to play around with the data and seeing how the human part is behind artificial intelligence uh, in labelizing categorizing data and and uh, yes and make machine learning possible so basically you have all these six areas you are certainly aware that they are not um, they are not really they are combining each other um, uh, how do you say complement they are com complementary one to each other and of course you may you can uh, tend lines between digital world and me and the world wide web or the robots and artificial intelligence um, the gaming part too um, has his part of artificial intelligence, and of course, if you want to to build your own project, so you need to speak IT. Um, I guess the most important and challenge of this uh, new subject are these four points. It is actually supposed to be balanced between three things the knowledge the technical know-how and also i I'm, i wrote it here in french but uh, i guess in english you can say uh, know how to be uh, it's likely in that way but uh, the, the important part, part of the savoir être is that you also consider the moral and ethical part of all these uh, areas and also of all this know-how, technical know-how. So the consequences of all this and uh, basically the part of myself as a student or fu a future citizen, citizen in this uh, digitalized world. So it is uh, student-centered that's really important we don't want uh, don't want it to be uh, an, an, yeah, a frontal course on a subject and uh, where the kids stay very pass passive but that they take an active part in it basically we really uh, uh, recommend project-based uh, based approach and and that's interesting in how integrating stem here you have like all subject in this one so it is multidisciplinar and um, 
I think it's important in that in that uh, term to explain that the team uh, which is um, working on these uh, digital sciences uh, it's about seven or eight persons who, who came really comes really from uh, lots of different hor horizons. So we have language teacher. Uh, Carolina and um, and uh, Gerard, for example, social sciences teachers, art teachers. We have also science teachers, uh, mathematics and informatics, also natural sciences, chemistry, and I make a few dots because it's it's this is the important part of it. Uh, I don't think that um, that uh, reducing this kind of subject to one kind of teacher uh, is very useful because um, it's the combination of all the point of views that brings the richness to, to this uh, subject. The idea behind all this is also that uh, you have the digital science core, um, uh, si sorry, so digital science uh, subject, and uh, that uh, for me, for example, I'm an art teacher, I have uh, my class in digital sciences, and I picked up, uh, for example, the, the idea of artificial intelligence and face recognition and face tracking. And I take this subject with me in my art course and I do some uh, drawn filter mesh on, the, on a mesh in my art uh, class and then bring it back, the product, uh, bring it back to digital sciences and see how I can technically integrate it and use my own made self-made uh, filter uh, in my Snapchat, for example. And I guess that's the, a, a real, a real interesting way because you have the digital sciences combining lots of uh, subjects and you have the possibility to take it and make. Uh, ma Yes, make it further in your own uh, subject. That is the presentation of, uh, of uh, the new subject. I guess, I hope you have uh, questions about it. And um, yes, Adi, I think we have lots of time uh, to, to take some, uh, some questions. And uh, really, again, thank you for this opportunity. And I hope uh, the audience uh, can get something interesting from it. Thank you very much, Claire. Uh, it's been very interesting. And I think people are being quite intrigued by your background as an arts teacher, I must say, because we have had a few questions coming uh, that relate to creativity, arts, and even uh, heritage conservation. So uh, I'm going to pick up a few of those. Uh, and the first one is, how do you combine STEAM careers and the enhancement of the artistic heritage? And do you have any suggestions? I guess uh, art has a privileged uh, relationship with uh, with the techniques and new technologies. I, I just take one example. Uh, the rise of impressionism was actually only possible because there was color in a tube. And before that, uh, the, the artists had to be in their atelier and, um, and, and mix all the colors. And so they, had, they, they were in nature, but only just took lots of drawings and took it back in the atelier and then made it afterwards. And the fact that color is in the tube, they could take the tube out and then began to draw uh, in real life and notice, oh, the light is changing. I have to do it um, uh, yes, faster. So that's the, the first important thing. I think this, this bridge between the two, they are really uh, connecting. About arts uh, heritage, uh, heritage. Uh, so sorry. Hmm. There are lots. I guess there are lots of different uh, possibilities. And, and um, hmm. 
I come back to, to facial recognition. I guess it's, uh, I don't know if you know Google Arts and Culture, this, uh, this uh, uh, yes, this web app uh, existing where you can, for, for example, uh, take your picture of your face and it through uh, artificial intelligence, it goes and search in the whole uh, data settings they have on uh, similar um, humans uh, in the artworks and show it to you. So uh, that's a, a little, yeah, it's like playful, but an, uh, an example of uh, how to make this bridge and then go further where you want to go. I hope I understood the, the question right. Yes, I think you did. Um, let me have a look for another question. Uh, actually, uh, another one that still relates to creativity is is quite straightforward. Uh, how can I make my students more creative using Steam? Hmm. Um, yeah, it there's really interesting questions and big questions. Um, creativity, Steam. How can I do that? So, first of all. I guess it's important to to train the mindset of creativity. That uh, that means that uh, experimenting is a very important part of the of the process. So, like you you make experiments with uh, in in chemistry or in physics or or. Or yes, or in language, for example, you know, perhaps the cadavric ski where I take, uh, I, I begin a, a phrase and then I cover the my words and I give it uh, to the next one and he, he writes again more words and so on. And so afterwards you have a, a very creative uh, phrasing and you can upon that uh, explore further in history. That's with words. but. I think it's more about the mindsets. And actually, if you take words, color, um, in, uh, processing in on informatics, for example, or scratch with the block, um, it's it's about really testing, and then let uh, things come up and see that it's uh, the the experimenting is a first part, and then afterwards, if you pick up interesting interest interest. Uh, um, interesting results, sorry, uh, and then um, make the, the students reflect on, okay, that is really cool. How could I uh, reproduce that? Or what are the different elements I need to reproduce this, uh, this kind of results, for example? So for me, it's basically first in the students, in experimenting, in, in uh, yes, let, let uh, down all the boundaries and try and then reflect and retry and reflect. And, and also the collab collaborative part, collaboration part is very interesting because uh, I have my experiment and then Eddie, you come and you see my experiment and you say, oh, I would do that and add this. And so it can also grow in, yes, within a group, for example. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we've got time for one more question. Now, I think this one fits right uh, in your alley. You are here, you have just presented to us a um, new topic, a new subject in school. Uh, we have a question here uh, that's asking if all, uh, all the STEM um, experiences, experiments that you are producing, should they all fit into the curriculum? I guess the question is how much of a disruptor are you and how much do you encourage people to be disruptors? Hmm. We are trying with this subject to to be re, uh, disruptive and but in a very legal uh, yes we have the legal frame but actually we are now uh, training the teachers and we see that it is really not easy for the teachers because they are used to think in one direction and within boundaries, very specific specific boundaries. That's the first step to, step to say, okay, you are not, um, even if you don't 
um, how do you call that? Sorry, Eddie, maîtrisé, uh, even if you don't control every part uh, of the elements you will uh, try out or yes, the results, you don't know what, what are now the results. I think there it's time for the teachers and that's not easy to let go and to leave control and, uh, and in, in, in that way to be sub subversive then not in the idea of the teacher who, who is really a master of everything and control everything, but also planning parts of, let's see what will happen. And that was to my, uh, for the training. It was really impressive how, how teachers are, um, are afraid of it, afraid of the situation that uh, they are experimenting or do something for the first time in this uh, case and, and not knowing all answers. But I guess this is the interesting part because uh, it, it, uh, it turns the teacher uh, into a coach and uh, it lets enough place for the students. So being disrupted disrupting is simply uh, begin to uh, yes plan some moments where you don't are uh, the master master of the puppets thank you very much for that and for these uh, encouraging words and inspirational words to just push the boundaries a little bit more and try new things. Um, so thank you again for your presentation. I will now uh, introduce our second speaker. Uh, Martha Helbens was a chemistry teacher for years before she engaged in an advisory role for educators and industry professionals on how to transform complex global goals and industry challenges into solvable cases for students. Today, she will present to us her case-based approach and how it can help you bring the real world into your classroom. Martha, yeah. thank you very much for being with us. The floor is yours. Well, Eddie, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak my passion and my goals in life because you've already uh, talked to me. You know, it's really my passion to help students see the, the um, the love I have for, for, for STEAM, actually, that's it. And uh, I think it's uh, for, for all of us, we, we would love to, to have the students love STEAM as much as that we do. So how do we encompass that? How, how can we get them to love it? Um, it's, it's also, I didn't know the, the story of Claire before, so her talk. And I think it's a really nice match, her story and mine, that it matches really good. So. You'll hear some same stuff, but a lot of different and new things. Um, first, let me introduce myself. Um, um, I'm going to put on a, a presentation besides me. We've practiced this before. <laughs> Let's see if it works. Yes, and then this one. Eddie, is this how we practiced it? I think it looks good. Yes, nice. Yes. Very good. Um, so now you see me and next to me you see my presentation and it's a kind of interactive presentation because I will start drawing later and you will see me looking below, uh, looking, looking at my table but I'll be talking anyway so it'll be fine. Um, first let me introduce myself. I'm, I'm just a chemistry teacher. I've studied chemistry in Utrecht in the Netherlands and uh, for eight years I've been just teaching children um, and with, with a goal as, as goal that all the students should study chemistry because that's the best subject there is for me. Um, but I didn't know a lot of things about the real world and the children were asking things. Why should I know this? Why do I need to know this? And I didn't know the answer. So what I did after teaching, uh, I went to companies and I went there to work there and um, what I discovered there is the start for my company that I have now, and it's called Company in the Classroom in English. So um, I'm bringing the company back to the classroom, and um, I started my own company. And my own company is called, in English, Company in the Classroom. And um, there's a bit of the logo in the classroom, and in Dutch it's called Bedrijf in the Klas. But I will not bother you with that. So it's just, let's call it company in the classroom. Um, 
so this is what I do now. And for, for more than 10 years, for over a decade, I have been teaching and helping and training teachers to bring companies in their classroom and uh, and questions from the companies, from the industries in a, in a, a way that students uh, understand and comprehend and, and enthusiasms them. Um, and also I've been teaching, training companies, people from companies, how to tell their stories in such a way that the students are able to comprehend what they're telling and the message they want to deliver to the students because all it's it can be hard to understand what a company actually does. So this is my company and from this uh, part I will tell you what my thoughts are in how to enthusiasm students to all love STEAM. Um, well, this is a bit negative. STEAM is not for me, but there are still children who think STEAM is not for them. But actually, STEAM is for everybody. Everybody in the world will meet STEAM, will meet technology, will meet digital uh, stuff, will meet computers in their lives. All the, it, it, even if you're a farmer or if you're a nurse, you will need STEM love to be able to live in this world and not have trouble with living actually. So everybody should love it. And then the, the part who loves it the most, they can uh, choose to study STEM because that's a different thing. Do you want a career in STEM or do you want to, do you just, are, are you able to deal with it actually? So STEAM is not for me, that's not an option, but there is, there are reasons why children think this, although it's not possible, of course, but they think it is. And I think that what makes children think that STEAM is not for them is what we do in classrooms. What we do is um, we put the teach teacher in front of the class and it's a bit black and white, but still in uh, most of the ways it's like this. And um, they tell children, they tell them, this is what you need to know. And they tell them, this is the, the answer. So they ask for the right answer. So that's one part. Teachers usually ask for the right answer. The other thing that doesn't help to make students love STEAM is that a lot of uh, subjects, a lot of uh, questions in the subjects are about high over level science things. So rocket science. So we make rocket science from STEAM. And uh, one of the letters in STEAM actually is science, of course, but there are a lot of other letters. So how do you get the other letters in your, so the other letters in your classroom? So science is taught a lot. We have to do research. The children have to think uh, like, like a researcher. They have to uh, look at the world like a researcher. They have to do proper research. And it was for me as a chemistry teacher, it was a really important goal that children should learn research. Um, yeah, well, thinking like researchers. But as, as some students, they, don't, they are not going to be researchers. A lot of students are not going to be researchers. So why should they have to learn how to think like a proper researcher at a university level? They don't actually. But we'll look at this, this how you can do that in the classroom. So this is the thing. At the school, we teach children knowledge. And we teach them skills. We teach them how to uh, calculate their, their, their numbers, how to uh, read, how to write, how to um, um, make a chemistry educate, uh, um, um, chemistry sum. I don't know what it's called in, in English, but it's, it's, we, we teach them how to do things, how to solve things. And we teach them how to give the right answer and they need actually they need this knowledge and they need these skills to be able to live and to be able to have a career in STEM or in STEAM or in, in any other uh, uh, career path. They need the things we learn them, the knowledge and the skills we learn them. But then we have the global goals and we, we uh, show them, well, there is a food shortage, there is a plastic um, um, soup 
and there is there are a lot of problems in the world and there are a lot of large questions we have to solve so that is why you need to learn what we learn you that is why we give you um, the stuff you learn at school but a student doesn't know how they can translate those really large questions to the knowledge and skills we teach them at school so how does a student know how to translate those questions into the knowledge and skills they, they, they learn at school. How do they use the knowledge and skills to answer those questions? The questions are too big. They need big science. They need difficult things. They need things they don't understand. It's too big for them. So how can we help these students to show how they can have a, a difference, how, how they can make a difference in the world, how they can contribute or how they can choose a career path, how STEM is for them. So this is a big problem. We, we teach them too big, the, the things are too big and, and they don't know what they can do with these things. So what can they do? Make it smaller. That's the answer. If we can make things smaller for them, they can grab it. They can understand it. They can do it and let them do things. Students love to do things. So that's also what we're going to look at. So if we have the world with a big, large questions and a lot of global goals and, and uh, environmental issues and everything, and we need a lot of skills and knowledge to solve that. And a student thinks, oh, well, that's not for me because it's too big and I'm not smart enough and I won't be able to do that. We can make it smaller. And um, you see, I've, I've, I've uh, left a, um, a bit of space between the world problems and our school who teaches knowledge and skills. And uh, the part what, which is between are the companies. So here are companies. And companies, they work on parts of the problems of the world. So they just pick one point and they just they um, well, I have a, a company near me they make uh, a new kind of um, uh, booklets in which you can write but it's durable so you can write wipe it out and use it again and it's not you we don't use paper anymore we use a stone paper it's actually called so this is a company and it, it gets just one question from all the global terrible things that are happening and they say well that's what we solve and we also need our knowledge and skills but it's a lot uh, more comprehensible for children and we do find different answers and different things but it's a lot more you can see it in your neighborhood you can touch it you can see it you can feel it so these answers are seeable are in the everyday world of the children and these uh, skills and knowledge and skills that, that are needed for the questions of the company are a lot more, uh, well, well they wait a lot closer to the skills we learn at school and the knowledge. So you see the, the, the um, we get a lot closer to the, to the things we do at school, but there's still one thing missing. Because where companies are solving problems, companies are solving cases and they do this every day. How can I make paper that's wipeable? How, how can I make it good wipeable so it gets clean enough? How can I develop a pen uh, from which the ink is wipeable? I mean, I mean that those are really small things. Uh, behind me is a car from Duplo. How can I make a toy that's um that, that's that's uh, uh, usable in different ways and it has to be sturdy and it has to be uh, playful and it has to be colorful how can i make that those are smaller questions uh, questions with which children can relate so what we don't do enough in education is ask those kinds of questions because they are still too big uh, our students are not uh, not capable yet of solving company questions. So we still have to scale it down. We have to split them up into smaller questions which children can relate to and can work on. And it's a different thing from, well, there's a difference. Um, let's see, I can, how can I uh, show you? The difference is, um, this is, this is a, a toy, how hard is the plastic? So that's it, it, that could be in a in physics class. It could be a test, 
Now it's a real context, context rich case. How hard is the plastic? You can measure it. There's a measuring tool and you can measure it. So that's a normal question that could be in our school books already. But the real question is, how can I make which material is durable enough? And then children have to think about, hey, what is durable? What is material? Which materials can I use? So they have to ask questions themselves to solve the case. So if you put a case in the center and you make a case centered approach, children can use their knowledge and skills they learn at schools to find probable answers. And it makes it makes a really big difference if you use real cases instead of questions you want them to answer to to tackle skills. To teach skills, to train skills. So that's a big difference, but I'm going to show you how it works. Um, we're going to choose a really big world question and I'm going to put it in a, in a sort of funnel. So we're going to funnel it down into a question children can work at at school. So a really big question is um, um, how can we get energy and not pollute the whole world? Something like that. So something about durable energy, this uh, energy problem. Clean energy. How can we get clean energy? Um, I, I use a lot of how questions. How can we get clean energy? How can drives, uh, cars drive by themselves? How can, uh, whatever, how can? How can we get energy, clean energy? Um, what companies do, they put up um, wind turbines. So a company question is not how can we get clean energy, but they say, well, how can I put a wind turbine uh, up? Uh, how can I install a wind turbine? How can I? install a wind turbine. That's a lot smaller and especially when wind turbines are installed in a the neighborhood, they can see it in the neighborhood. They can touch it, they can grab it, they can hear what noise they make, they can see the shades they, they give, they can feel it, they can, they can, they can, can live it. And at schools it's still a too big a question because they won't install a whole wind turbine, but they can, um, uh, they can think of things that help um, um, lessen the noise because a wind turbine makes a lot of noise, for example. So at school we ask, how can we make um, a wind turbine with, with less noise? And they can make small wind turbines at school. And you have to think of a good question, but this is something I just think about now. So how can we make a wind turbine with less noise? So, so you see, we make the, the large questions here. We make them smaller from a company and even smaller from the uh, at schools. But why do we need those companies? Because they're in the neighborhood and we can talk to people who work there and we can ask the people, what are your questions? What do you do all day? Uh, what do you love about your job? So the people who work here, they are for the students, they um, they are touchable, askable, questionable. Uh, they are weir, real. They are people we can become. So the students can see and can look at those uh, those people. And the people that the, the, they, they use the, the skills and the knowledge the students learn at schools. So it's it's makes it meaningful their lessons and their teachings. So that's what I um, what I would propose. Let's take the windmill um, and, and, and look at it from world, from global perspective, from a company's per perspective and from school school's perspective and make the large question smaller and smaller until it is comprehensible and in the neighborhood. For, for children, so they see how STEM makes a difference, how STEM is near them and how they can do STEM, how STEM is for them. Well, you can ask a lot of questions uh, about installing wind turbines. Um, and I just chose the one, um, how can we make the sound less? So the, the large noises less, but you can also ask, what it, does it cost to install wind turbine? And you can ask that for project developers. So they, they are the ones who do that. And you, send, you see, you, you, um, uh, you ask it in, to companies in your neighborhood. 
uh, what is the best location? That's a, a lot of times governments go about it. So you can ask someone from the government, governments, so, um, to tell about it at your school. So the children see that science is not something that just happens in a laboratory, but it happens in their neighborhood, around the corner, in the companies, at the government, just around the corner. It is there, it's there and it's everywhere and it's for them. They can do this too. Um, you can also see that you can uh, use your language in a science uh, 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 project. So in a STEM project, how do you install a wind turbine? It's a real technical question, but you also need your language because people need to know about a wind turbine. So you combine, and that's the same thing actually that Claire just said about digital sciences. You combine all your subjects because there's never a case, a question that just is about one subject. There is no question case imaginable that's just solvable only by science, only by techni technique or only by engineering. So you also need uh, a good language, you need your, your geography, you need your people skills to solve a question. And that also makes it that more children see, hey, uh, I'm not that interested in the in the technical stuff and engineering stuff, but I do love it when there's a people thing about it. So I, I do like to think about uh, engineering when people are involved. And that makes a really big uh, difference for some students to still to to go and love science, STEAM. Not only science, so science and technology and engineering, and mathematics, of course, and art, but that's uh, well, that's in it for me. So bring the real world into your classroom. And uh, this is a case based approach. Uh, when you want to see um, uh, examples, more examples, I have made a lot of um, lesson materials, lesson projects, and um, I've put them in a PowerPoint, Eddie, so they can uh, download them. Uh, is one from Philips about MRI scanners, one from Van der Lande, they make the, the um, at the airports, they make the, the luggage belts uh, with which all the, the luggage is transported. And uh, you can you can look at the, the uh, case based approach lesson examples at the websites that are in the uh, downloadable thing from this um, from this presentation. Is that right, Eddie? Yes, so everything will be available. Yes. Online. So do you have any questions? Because this is actually my story and I have a lot more to tell, but uh, we don't have that much time. So I think it's a good thing to go to the questions. Thank you very much, Martha. Uh, yes, there have been a few questions coming up. Um, uh, quite a few questions are actually relating to the age of the students because the topics you cover and the, the real world issue you cover are very serious, uh, very big practical issues. But how do you address or how, how do you find ways to integrate that at, at lower level, kindergarten level and, and yes. with younger children? Yes, well, I've, 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 I have my Duplo here behind me. Um, now you can all the questions, if you have a good case, a good problem based case um, um, defined, then you can you can uh, talk about it with stud students from kindergarten to the uh, promotion uh, tra uh, trajectory at uh, universities. Because uh, when you have the, um, I'm, I'm going back to the windmill, to the, in the wind turbine. When you have a wind turbine, you can make it really difficult and you can ask children how much energy does it really deliver according to the, the energy it costs to make it. That's a really difficult question. So you have to balance things and you have to really calculate a lot and know a lot of physics and materials and everything. But you can also do it in kindergarten and you can ask how do you actually put a wind turbine up it's, and, and it's quite difficult and you give them a pole of wood or a pen, something, and you ask them for a system to put a pen right up, up, upright. Oh, my English is lagging now, it's, it's, it's getting evening. Um, so, so even this part, like how do you put it upright or how do you transport it? So the parts of a wind turbine are really large. And if you go with kindergarten and you have a picture only of a wind turbine next to a house, it's, these are, those are really large. But if you have a building corner, in the Netherlands, we all have corners in kindergarten, all the children playing corners, but let them make 
um, uh, a map from a city or give them a city map, give them cars, just toy cars, and ask them how you can transport these really large, this is really small uh, <laughs> next to this <laughs> big Duplo car, but how do you how do you transport really large uh, the wind blades, the blades from the wind turbine in a city? And ask them to play with it and they can experience what the problems are. And you don't go further than that in kindergarten, but if, if they are at, at high level uh, high school, you are going further than that. You can also play with a Duplo and a pen, but you will ask for the, the, uh, the angles uh, in which it has to direct and in which uh, um, uh, how, how, how you're going to solve it when you have to uh, cross a, a big uh, highway and everything. So you make it more detailed, more specific. And how more detailed you would make it, the diff more difficult it is, the more high level it is. But you can do it with kindergarten kids as well. Mine love these things, my kindergarten kids, so. Well, there you go, real experience. Um, some other participants are feeling a little bit more philosophical about STEM and, and why we use it. Uh, and indeed, your, your case-based approach tends to give really practical, uh, how, do you th how much do things cost and, and questions like that. But what's your take on getting them to question Bigger, bigger questions, bigger philosophical questions. Why do we use STEM? Why do we? Uh, why should we use STEM just for the benefit of humans? Or do you also suggest to use a more? Um, how would I put it? Yeah, I think philosophical approach is is a good summary. Well, I think that's a scientification of the STEM. What we do. I mean, you can also always philosophize everything. And I don't. I think that's a good thing to do. So um, my oldest son, he's, he's ten years old. He came to me and he said, "Mom, everything is made around me. How can it be? How do th people think about? What, what was the first time somebody invented a pen?" And and he's all. He said, "I'm getting a headache because I'm just. I keep thinking about this. But he keeps thinking about it because we have it. We talk a lot about." everyday things so you can get philosophical about everyday things and um but it's more their things instead of really uh, a, a distance apart and distanced from them something that you can talk about but it's not theirs so i think it's it's important to make it touchable and theirs and then from then on you can always philo philosophize everything so why not why not indeed? Uh, I'm going to go with one last question um, before we uh, round things up. One of our participants is, is uh, observing that your, your method, your case-based approach, uh, can be a bit probably time-consuming because you do have to research the, pro uh, the problems uh, quite from all angles. So how do you, how do you time manage? How do you, and do you have recommendations to make things a little bit faster for, for teachers who Definitely. are a bit short for time? Yes. Well, I, I always say you can make it as big and as small as you as you like. So if you uh, choose, I'm going to put this one. Where is the, where's my wind turbine? The questions. Um, if you choose to do a really large um, a, a project with all the subjects together and all the teachers together and the whole school is, is working on it, you can do that for eight weeks, for a whole school year, you can do uh, the, the wind turbine. I mean, people will get bored, but you can do that. And uh, you can make it really, really big and you, you research with the children all the sites and you go interviewing uh, people at streets and everything. You can you can make it really large, but you can also make it really small by just choosing uh, one question. What's the best location and and not even can I zoom in? Yeah, and not even. Uh, well, I think it's it's important that that you do note do, do you tell the central question but you can tell it you don't have to research it and and chew on it we, we call it in the netherlands you just chew on it uh, so we just we say well this is the the central question but in our case we're going to just go by what's the best location for a windmill and uh, well this is a map what questions would you have to answer to choose the best location and that's the that's the question you put in a classroom and that's and you talk about it for 10 minutes and the lesson goes on. 
So we get our books together and we say, well, let's go. Uh, at, we were at page 53. Let's get on with the lesson. But so you, you can make it really small think uh, exercises, thinking exercises, or hey, let's uh, in, in the neighborhood, a wind, wind, wind turbine is installed. What do we know to do that? Wh which questions have to be answered? You can just talk about it with the kids and that can be really short and just even in five minutes already. And but you can also make the, a, it a really, really big pro project with all the schools in the city together and with everybody and all the companies and weeks and weeks and. Well, it's up to you. You can make it big and small what you want. There you go. I think that's a, that's a good summary. It, you can you can go small, you can go big, and you can choose which angle you want to approach the question as well. Whether you want to question uh, the meaning of life or whether you want to question how to build a wind turbine. Uh, I'm afraid this is going to be the end of this uh, very good, very interesting <laughs> evening. Uh, thank you very much to both of our presenters uh, for their uh, passion and for sharing their knowledge. If we haven't gotten around to your question, uh, feel free to email them to me of course and we will try to follow up and, and direct them to the to the presenters for tonight um, i would just like to remind all of you that uh, the steam uh, steamit project also offers uh, what we call career sheets which um, present stem careers uh, from real professionals how they got there why they got there and what it took for them to get there uh, and this is a very also um, practical way to present STEM careers to your students. Uh, and also on a final note, um, there are other events coming up in these exciting new days that are the STEM careers days of which today is the first day. Uh, a few webinars where you will learn, learn from innovators in the STEM industry, how they got into being innovators and what the careers of the futures will be. So don't be shy, come and join us. You can find the calendar for the events on the STEM Alliance and the um, probably not scientists, but the STEAMIT website. Uh, so go check them out and register for the webinars uh, as they come along. Thank you very much again to both of you for your participation tonight. Uh, and I'm sure there will be more follow up questions coming your way very, very soon. On behalf of the STEAMIT, the STEM Alliance and the Scientex project, I'd like to thank all of our attendees for coming and joining us tonight. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Have a lovely evening. <laughs>